Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Center for the Less Good Idea and to this evening's presentation of How Showing the Making, the Pepper's Ghost. My name is Athena Mazarakis, and I'm the momenteur of So, the Academy for the Less Good Idea. And we're very, very delighted that we'll be celebrating the 10th season at the Center in October. So this is a moment for us to look back, to reflect, to reinvestigate and reinterrogate what has emerged for us at the center from season one all the way through to season nine, and to look at particular forms or formats, approaches, methodologies that have been really generative and productive. So one such form and format that we started investigating in season seven is the Pepper's Ghost, and we are returning to it in season seven, in season 10. So we started in season seven and there's there have been a number of iterations of how we've worked with the Pepper's Ghost. So what the Academy is doing is taking this opportunity with the approach of season 10 to showcase and leverage on some of that momentum that the season is generating and draw from some of the artists and some of these approaches and processes that we're working with and showcase them within the Academy. So sort of extrapolating some of the learning that we've been through the learning that has emerged through all this investigation, through all the seasons, and a moment to reflect on it with an audience, with ourselves. So what you're about to experience this evening is an illustration, a performative illustration of the Pepper's Ghost, how the mechanism works, how we've reimagined it in a digital way, particularly how we found it to be really a powerful tool in working with existing archives. And then we'd really love to share with you three pieces that are in process towards season 10. So this evening's uh, presentation is presented by Bronwyn Lace, the co-founder and co-director of the center, and Bongile Khorata Lechoche Zulu, who has been really intimately involved in all of these iterations of the Pepper's Ghost. And then eight of the artists who are part of the season and who will introduce themselves to you at the end. And then of course our incredible production team who are an integral, integral part of making this happen. And they'll also be introduced to you along the way. So this is performative illustration. There are moments of sort of formal presentation and then there'll be moments where you really see us in process and working with the device. And then there'll be an opportunity at the end for a short question and answer session. We are crossing fingers and everything else we can cross that we are not load shed. We haven't been load shed. So just putting that out there that if we go into darkness, that's what's happened. Um, but we are praying that that won't be the case. So enjoy the show and we'll chat after. Hello. Hello. Jimelan. Okay. Sanbanani. Ebo. Mulweni. Ewe. Sharp wizards. Fede. Sharp. Eta. Ola. Ola. Yeah. That's my voice is doing a thing, eh? As you can hear. Hello. <coughs> Hello. So, so I just want less clothing noise. Oh, okay. So I was thinking of saying those things, like the Pepper's Ghost, 19th century, like random shit, and then we jumble it up, uh -huh. and then I just like shut myself up. <laughs> and like I can't, I can't actually see what's happening down there. But I will show you. So somebody needs to light down there so that I can see it on the thing there, the, the playback thing. The playback thing is on. Cool. Shut. <laughs> Dave, what should I say? Oh, the Pepper's Ghost. Named after John Henry Pepper, who popularized it in 1862, the Pepper's Ghost is a 19th century theatrical Theatrical illusion technique that uses a half-silvered mirror at a 45-degree angle. So the projector projects onto the floor and the half-silvered mirror lets it through so that you see it here. Behind. With the introduction of video, was it? 
What? Uh huh. Where ma? Okay, cut. Inse. <laughs> okay. So the true version is that the Pepper's Ghost is named after John Henry Pepper, and it is a 19th century illusionary technique that uses, as I did say, a half silvered mirror. And if things are lit in front of the mirror, then you can see the reflection on the mirror. And the device also allows us to see things behind the mirror if they are lit. Today, the paper's ghost becomes a hybrid of digital and analog. And using our own filming, editing, and compositing, and of course with live projection, new possibilities emerge. There is a demand for precision. <laughs> and <laughs> there's also a demand for real play. within the Pepper's Ghost. And this is only really made possible with the help of our technical team. So here today with us, we have sound, and on sound we have Zane Vali and Ross Calverwell. I've never said a surname out loud before. <laughs> Did I get it right, Ross? Yes. Thank you. And then we have Matthews Pala on lighting who makes the back and front stuff possible. And then on videography, editing, and compositing, we have Noah Cohen and Octavia Sonyan. So one of the most frustrating limitations of the ghost actually leads to some of its most productive moments. Take, for example, a dancer whose immediate impulse is to dance, but there are obvious limitations within this device. This leads to different iterations of dance, different possibilities. For example, limiting it to body parts or a projection of the dancer scaled down. The question that we always find ourselves asking when working with the Pepper's Ghost is how do we work or look at image in a collective and collaborative manner? Eighteen sixty two Pepper's Ghost. This illusionist technique has the particularity of making ghosts appear in the image. Here we will see autochromes and film excerpts devoted to Vodun rituals recorded in Dahomey, now Benin, in nineteen thirty. They are projected into the Pepper's Ghost almost a hundred years after they were taken. Contrary to the belief in a faithful representation of reality that prevailed in the early days of photography, the use of this device in South Africa today and through a contemporary artistic lens literally and figuratively displaces the discursive frameworks within which these images were conceived. The device allows one to enter to intervene in the narrative that once accompanied it, to multiply its meanings and points of view. Through this device, the silhouettes printed in the image mingle with those who take possession of it today. Playing with what George Diddy Huberman explored from the Warbur Warburgian notion of the survival of images. These artistic experiments link the images of colonial archives to the constitutive paradoxes of the image, namely 
The nature of a ghost and its capacity for revenge, for haunting. The collection of still and moving images of Dahomey was entrusted to the French Roman Catholic priest, a missionary, Francis Aupere. Familiar with and an admirer of the Vodun religious practices of the Gulf of Benin, the autochrome technique, chromatic prints on glass plates, shares with film the transparency of the image. Albert Kahn, 1860 to 1940. Albert Kahn was born on March 3rd, 1860, in the Lower Rhine region. He was the eldest of six children. His family belonged to a small community of Jewish shop owners, and his father was a livestock merchant. In only a few years, from 1889 to 1893, he built up a fortune by speculating first on gold and diamond mines in South Africa. Albert Kahn died in his Bologna estate in, on the 14th of November, 1940, the day after the French defeat. He had just been registered as a Jew. And as a result, he was unceremoniously buried in a mass grave in the new Bologna Cemetery. 1909 to 1931, the archives of the planet. Once Albert Kahn's fortune was made, he got started on the creation of his philanthropic project. Albert Kahn advocated for cooperation between populations starting with the creation of different foundations and encouraging a breaking down of barriers between disciplines. As of 1909, he embarked on his visual inventory project of the world, Archives de la Planète. Conscious of the changes at work in the world, Albert Kahn imagined an overall project by saying, I would like to put stereoscopic photography screenings, and the cinematograph to work on a large scale in order to capture once and for all the aspects, practices, and conditions of human activity whose fatal disappearance is no longer only a matter of time. He used two recent and complementary Lumiere brother inventions, the cinematograph and the autochrome, the first recording movement the second, color. At the beginning of the 1930s, the consequences of the Wall Street crash led to his ruin and brought this project to a standstill. Thanks to the influence of, influence of admirers of his work, the Haute de Seine department acquired in 1936 Albert Kahn's property and the collection. Eighteen eighty seven to nineteen forty five, Father Francis Aupair, sent by the Society of African Missions to Dahomey from nineteen oh two to nineteen twenty six. His pastoral work gave him the opportunity to visit the surrounding villages and to discover the culture of the Dahomeans. He approached it with empathy, tried to understand its internal logic, and rejected the prejudice of seeing it only as witchcraft or demonic work. Francis Aupair gradually established himself as a recognized specialist in Dahomean religions and traditional, traditional customs. Aupair gathered Dahomean scholars around him in order to dispel the equivocation by which the difference between so-called civilized states and the so-called primitive states in the service of the former is given absolute superiority. The principle was stated by Francis Aupair in the first issue of a magazine, mm -hmm. Les Reconnaissances Africaines, in 1925, mm -hmm. which was mainly only written by Dahomean teachers and seminaries. Mm -hmm. Aupair assiduously attended the Institute of Ethnology mm -hmm. and through it met Albert Kahn. Mm -hmm. 
In his lectures, he did not hide his admiration for many aspects of African cultures, going so far as to find reasons for polygamy and human sacrifice. These excessive ideas shocked many listeners who complained to the superior general. In order to put an end to the scandal, the superior general asked the authorities in Rome to remove Orpair from office on the grounds that he had reckless and audacious theories in favor of the rehabilitation of blacks. On the day of the inauguration of the 1931 colonial exhibition in Paris, the president of the Republic, irritated by Orpair's criticism of the French colonial system and forced labor, met Orpair's superiors and said that he is to be silenced. As early as 1927, Orpair had become involved in denouncing forced labor in the colonies and sought to alleviate the suffering of local populations. But he never questioned the validity of colonization. Not even after the war, when he was elected deputy for the Dahomean Toga constituency of the Constituent Assembly in October of 1945. 2021 to 2024, Moving in Images, Controversial Memories, the project Cinemath, an ongoing collaborative project of which the Center for the Less Good Idea is part. It is an undertaking of interdisciplinary analysis, ethnology, cinema studies, history of representations, and the arts, in collaboration with heritage partners, Museum du Quai Branly, Albert Kahn Museum, and the French Cinema Archives. On the issues to do with analysis, remediation, and the reuse of cinema materials developed in controversial historical contexts, colonization, in particular. Collaborating institutions in Cinemath are Nanterre University in Paris, the Department of Image Arts and Contemporary Art at Paris 8, African Worlds Institute in Paris, the University of Abomey, Benin, and the Francophone Regional Center for Advanced Research and Social Studies at the University in Bucharest. December 6, 2021. A first official meeting of the Cinemath project takes place and includes screenings of documentary films from the colonial period on Africa at the University of Nanterre. Bronwyn Lace is presenting an introductory artist's talk towards the end of the day and as part of and it is part of a collaborating PhD seminar, Arts, Archives, and performance. It is co-organized by Professor Anna Zeiderer of Paris 8 and Didier Hunde of the University in Abome. Lace understands little as the seminar is in French. She is forced into attempting to read the room, following tone and facial expressions closely. Lace remembers footage of a funeral procession the body of the brother of a chief, carried from his home, wrapped and prepared for burial. Pain is etched on the faces of the people who surround him. This footage is followed by the preparation for the funeral. Goats roaming a kraal then caught by the hind legs and flung to the ground with great force, where they meet their immediate death. With this footage, the room leans back. Lace reads, small gasps, tutting tongues, deep breaths, audible empathy.
Okay, so in um okay. uh, in 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 the beginning Wow. beginning. Okay, okay. So in in the beginning, at the end. Thank you. Goodbye.
Yani ikina iwa mili mako poka kina iwi. Kisira ledi waki mariba. Kine kafula katata karele laka wapapa lotaka jale marite. Kahone matuwa kha etuwa le burite. Manche kia eta eta kha kibwana sesefale le sesefale. Kapa kabwana pulwe nchu yeme kwa khuru. Karuna barola resepe lucha karene raeta. Rayyabe la baroka ba dirapula. Kahone kwa le khurutu. Kaji ba kwe ba kha ebo kaji bo kazi patamaka. Bo kota wasa kasala kota nasale iforo la matoke la. Likai! Ukai! Se ini dina iwa mele ma kopo haki na iwi. Ki serele du haki mariba. Ki neka fula kata saka rele la kawa. Papa lo saka di ale marite ka hona ma joa kha e chwa le borite. Ba nchwe kya e cha e cha kaki. Ba na tese pale. Le tese pale. Ka ba ka ba na pulu en chwe yeme kwa khorong. I pona kha ate! Ka ro na barola rese pelo se kare nera e cha raya be la baroka. Ba dura ka yone pula kwa le koroto. Kari ba kwa e ba kha e bo kha di bo kha si pata maka. Mokota wasa kasa la kota na sale ipura la matoke la. Itwa li tulo. Kadu melo ya uri huna lina. Ipona hati. Ukai. Ukai. Kitwali tulo Kadumelo ya huri huna linda Nsena koe Nsena koe Kalipo e Nsena koe Kalipo e Nsena koe Kalipo e Nzena po e, kalipo e, nzena po e, kalipo e, nzena po e, kalipo e, nzena po e, kalipo e. Kahone rona marola recipe lucheta, rena reza raya bela baroka vajira ko ne pula ko ne koroto. Ko ne bokoya ba ko ne bokoya 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 ne
Bong kono le bon tata mo khol. Badim boka mo dubu, badim boka dingake. Badim boka mo disenyane, badim boka le sito. Bong kono le bon tata mo khol. Kibita le ona badim boka bantu, badim boka khanya, badim boka le rat. Badim boka khala le lo. Baloi. Aqui vou lhe lula, lescan catume. Batimba com o dugu, batimba com a dinha, batimba com o sito, batimba com o disanyane. Que bicha lona, batimba com o lerado. Que bicha lona, batimba com a canha. Que bicha lona, batimba com a lalera. Que bicha lona, batimba com a banha. Que bicha que se tocou lá na salona. Que bicha que ele levou. Pati mo ba kamo dugu, pati mo ka niyan, pati mo ba kamo di sanyan. Bong kun le bong, ko ko, ko, alang kuta. Bong kun le bong tatam kul, alang kuta. Pati mo ba kamo dugu, pati mo ba ka di ngaki, pati mo ba kamo di sanyan eh, pati mo ba ka lisito, ko. Gogo, go, alang kuta, eh ya, boma, eh eh, lebar lebar tofi, saya nong cakap nak korai rum na, na gogo, eh eh, kaki em. Ah, ini lagi mana yang mungkin hati ki ki mule, eh, ko kau te? Yang nung kuku kerja ko bela la kor eh, bona, ki ko bona mutu mutu na, ki bela kau te, right? Eh, ko bona, right? Hei luna, tu kamu, eh, ko kalau betul. Kiki boleh lah kau tanya nun kau bana kore, kamu siri siri kawan fiji, eh bak banca kena. Eh kita kita buat kita kita lu bana hati kok. Eh marwana kau kau rasa para wemel lagi ne? Ah ya aku nama kata kau kau, kita kita kau bana merajut awak, kita kau rasa kau. Eh, eh kibo, kau te kau kau te, eh, ah eh kau eh. Ah, wana ufeti kuku, eh eh, bo kya kita bo wa, eh bye bye kuku, bye bye. Thank you very much to each one of the performers and the musicians for offering us those seeds of what they've started making in workshops. Um, at this point, I'm actually going to invite all of the performers for a collective moment of making. So it is an idea, a possibility that we have a full ensemble moment, which we've not yet had a chance to really test. And this is the moment and you are obviously here and invited to witness. So there'll be a bit of stop and go, try this, try that, f feel it out, and we take it from there to wherever it ends up.
Thanks to the artists. Um, it's a, you know it's always a, a vulnerable position to be put in. Uh, it was just this week that we found these first proposals and provocations in response to the archival images and the device. And so um, this is this is revealing the thinking, the making, the most vulnerable state. Um, and we know that it's an absolute privilege to see it, but as a performer, it's, it's kind of very, very dangerous, potentially, territory. Um, particularly because we are working with a device that seems to lean into uh, other worlds and our belief systems and possibilities that exist far beyond what a museum catalog can do, what a vitrine holds. It's, uh, it evokes other possibilities and energies. And it's been incredible for us, I think, to witness that, to witness a kind of real honoring of the image in the looking. Um, so I'd love for you all to just individually introduce yourself and tell everybody what, how you sort of define your discipline in a few words. Um, and then I'd like to just open with a bit of a discussion, which will then open to the audience. Katlejo, maybe you could begin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, afternoon, everyone. My name is Katlejo Litsulonyani, and I'm an actor. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Dikele Dimudubu, and I'm a performer. My name is Mika Mangani. I'm a percussionist. Thank you. Uh, everybody, hello, hello. My name is Uwam Selolam Lafani. Uh, I like playing, so I'm an artist. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Anna Tikondra, and I am an artist. Hello, uh, this is Teresa Puti Mujela. I'm a performing artist and then a singer in the making. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Vusi Ndoi. I'm a Bantula creative. Thank you. <laughs> San Bonani. Hello, everybody. My name is Sengi Welo Shaba Madlala. And in this context, I'm a theatre maker. Thank you. So thank you, and, and Klengi, thank you for saying this context, because I think what happens at the center is that you come in with your particular hat, 
with the discipline that you're known for. And then there's every opportunity, as Teresa explained, to, <laughs> to explore that which you are not known for and that which you're interested in picking up. Um, and within the context of the academy, it's about the learning opportunities that exist in the room for us at every layer and level of our practice. Uh, where we learn from one another, there's a kind of a communal, collective, collaborative learning across the disciplines. And this device feels like it pushes it to an extreme. So it places us in a pretty tight confine to have eight performers trying to occupy that space is tricky, right? So you see that, that layering there in the moments where it was, it was great to see that first experiment, because all we said about our experiment this afternoon was we were going to have this provocation of a spinning chair. And uh, Noah and Octavia playing on the screen, and you all responding to each other's bodies, to the screen, to the reflection in the mirror, to, to the many different elements on the floor, in the mirror, and amongst one another. And trying, it's a kind of a, a deep exercise in, in, a, in empathy, mm -hmm. um, in understanding how you get across what you're interested in doing, but giving space and capacity for, for others to do the same and to just be in that deep noticing of one another and listening. Um, so this week and, and in the two weeks ago when we had a few days together, as practitioners, as artists, what are the kind of reflections that you have about performing and responding in this particular dynamic? I, I want to say, um, with this kind of medium, um, when you kind of throw yourself, so also like, this is also responding from a, 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 an actor who is also um, doing TV. Um, for me to do this, it uh, gives me the opportunity to explore more. So there's just never ending um, thoughts. You just, everything comes and multiplies with this. So uh, it's an interesting thing for me that, you know, one, one day I'm thinking this and the other, um, um, idea yeah, comes yeah. in, you know, and, and, you know, it's just never not work at mm, all, mm. you know. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's beautiful for me because I can just explore and explore infinity. Mm. Yeah. Um, for me, it was, this medium for me at first was pretty challenging. And I think a lot of it was because of the things that mm. I didn't imagine were possible, right? There's so many possibilities with this medium. And I think a, 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 in the beginning, I was like, mm, Pepper's ghost, okay, what ghosting? <laughs> <laughs> Do it, does it mean, is it, ne is it me, um, necessarily saying I'm bringing another body or an image or something? Um, so what's been interesting for me, as challenging as it was, was how I had to kind of lean on other people's eyes and um, points of views because mm -hmm when you are on the other side, it's kind of difficult to see mm. what the mirror is actually doing. So the, the spirit of collaboration has mm. been really beautiful for me. Um, mm. it, it's taught me to let go <laughs> quite a lot, just release, and just be a body that's um, able, willing, and ready to, to play. Mm. Um, yeah. Amazing, thank you. Yeah. I think, uh, hi again. <laughs> I think what it has, highlighted for me is the creativity in freedom within confinement. Mm. I don't know if that makes mm. sense. Mm. Um, how to be free in confinement, how to find ways of being free in confinement, and how to also be still you know, and be okay with the stillness because this device doesn't need a lot of, hmm. it, it, really, it really calls for stillness, but how to be creative, how to be free in the stillness as well, I think that has been a very important thought for me through the process, yeah. Thanks, Ash. Um, hi, everyone, okay. For me, um, this whole 
whole experience uh, has been uh, you know, one of the most explosive, explosive experiences that one has ever came across. Um, you know, uh, as much as Lenny had mentioned that um, there's a simplicity, you can be able to work, you know, with an object, with an object simply so and freely so. However, as a person who's got a lot of many, you know, things in my head, I also saw an, a, a possibility, you know, that one could also explore that and having to, to use all these possibilities, you know, since we've got the video people that we're working with, and then we also have the floor, which is a stage, normally I'm a dance also as well, and then it also allows you to be also an actor. At the same time, you can be able to multiply yourself. And, and it's something that I would like to, to see more, you know, much more than a, a simplicity, just the madness of many impossible things. Mm -hmm. Because right after a first exploration, you know, uh, on, on the workshop a couple of weeks ago, um, after I've, I've, I've viewed what you've explored, <laughs> one, you know, just got mad and wanted to add more and more <laughs> possibilities because of it's possible. Mm -hmm. And, and thank you uh, for, 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 for all the collaborators because they came with brilliant ideas and each and everyone is very free and the center allows each and everyone to contribute towards, towards each and everyone's idea mm -hmm. and you get to have an opportunity to, to be on stage and also to be off stage, you know, to co-conceptualize with others and co-direct with others, mm -hmm. you know, without waiting to be invited, you just invite yourself. Mm -hmm. And, and that, uh, yes, you know, that really communicates, uh, you know, a way of pulling resources together and, and also a way of, of having to be able to find one, you know, common milestone and one vision, you know, while we started, you know, scattered and with just an open idea, you know, and, and this is, it's, it's a great opportunity, I believe, not just only for me, but for all of us. As a person who's coming from uh, a cultural background, which is a Spansula, and in most cases, it, it has never been explored that much in the theaters or in the museums. Mm -hmm. And this is an institution, you know, on its own, that one could, you know, use the very same experience and, and expanding and sharing with the others. And so that the culture also can grow as well, more than just as a street, you know, dance, but as an art form that can also be abstract. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Bruce. So um, something to, to say that w w the journey that we've just begun together um, culminates with uh, pieces that we these pieces and, and many others that, are, that we're working over the next months. In October on the 18th, season 10 opens and it'll showcase um, a full program of Pepper's Ghost pieces uh, each night. So this room uh, we're likely to actually perform them twice because we can only fit, as you can see, a very small audience. Um, but the rest of the journey is also exciting. Uh, we'll see myself and Ntabi Singh, and we hope if funding comes through, we find out soon. Uh, but certainly the three of us are traveling in August to Benin. We're meeting colleagues there who have been part of this project for the last three years in terms of the investigation of the archive. Uh, Angelo Mustafa from Benin, a percussionist, has been with us all week. Uh, it's his second time in Johannesburg. And um, it's fabulous to have Angelo's um, perspective on the images, as well as other artists who were with us from Benin last August in a, in a workshop around these, this particular archive. Um, and then, you know, wonderful news is that in May 2024, these works uh, will travel to Paris and we'll have a performance program there where we bring the images that sit in their archives back to them, but in a different, through a different lens. Um, so this is the beginning of quite an exciting and long journey of work as we investigate what it is to look collectively, communally, collaboratively at uh, images that are controversial. Um, so if I can open up, if, if you're all comfortable with that, to <coughs> any comments or questions from the audience. And we have a, we have a mic that can be passed back. Yes. 
Hi, Brian. Uh, not sure if you're going to answer this sure. or members of the, the collective. What is the starting point for the engagement with what you regard as controversial imagery? And how do you, do you make it less controversial or by engaging with it, do you decrease how controversial it is? No. So over to you. I think, um, uh, you know, it's uh, in the context of the Cinemath project, which is one that is formed outside of the, the kind of terms of that project are agreed to outside of the center's involvement. But it's looking at archival imagery and, and footage that has, A, not really seen the light of day. This particular collection has not been in public view. And it was often sort of regarded as with father or pair being uh, silenced, regarded as um, not uh, anthropologically or ethnographically interesting, uh, particularly the film footage, because um, obviously the, the rituals and rites that he was filming uh, would typically actually happen at night or indoors, and the equipment didn't allow for that. So they were reenacted and re-performed, and that has been a criticism uh, historically from uh, ethnography, basically, around its validity um, in terms of talking about wooden rights. So um, there's, I think, yes, the, the moving images, controversial um, memories is, is an aspect of it. But when they are projected here and our bodies are implicated inside of the image, it's about leaning into their complexity rather than trying to simplify them. Um, and it's about uh, evoking our, our own um, relationships to the image. Um, and it's also not necessarily about accuracy. So we have an allowance as artists to be doing a different kind of looking. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but it's, it's interesting to be in a conversation with uh, academics at all of these various institutions who have joined us in workshops uh, last year in this context and who have deep relationships with these images because they are a point of research for them and yet found themselves at the end of the week saying that they were seeing aspects, or rather feeling aspects, that they had yet to feel about their material, or the material that they're researching. James? Yeah, I mean, just to, just to follow up on that point, uh, you know, these are, and I've seen other archival footage of this kind. James, the mic. Mm. <laughs> um, just, to, just to follow up on that point, um, the, in discussion, that the uh, I've seen other examples of this type of archival footage. That there, there are many mm. around the continent and around the world. Mm. But the, the the point about this one in particular, which you know your story brings out, and then the, the performers all um, flesh out in their interaction with it, is is that it is itself uh, an enactment. It's a reenactment. So the authenticity point is a key point. Mm. So the original archival footage is in fact a performance yes. of a ritual, mm. which is not recoverable. Mm. So the original force of the ritual and the, the sacred power of it mm. are not recoverable because it's being mediated in the ways that it's being mediated, both historically and, and uh, technologically mm. through the camera. So, you know, this device is like a fantastic prism for, for you know, embroidering as you're all doing now, which I think is the, the best aspect mm. of this, this entire concept, mm. uh, even more on the notion of not only the authenticity of the original rites and, and rituals that went along, with Vidan or with indeed any other mm. um, belief system that predated colonialism, mm. but but also um, how that's communicated, reinterpreted, and transmitted. 
um, and, and turn, opening it up into a, a bunch of different art forms is a really important way of, of recovering the, the, the power of it, mm -hmm. you know, outside of the, the kind of depredations and suppressions that it's gone through in colonial history. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's a comment, it's not a question, mm. sorry. No, lovely. Anyone else? Tulani? Um, no, uh, it's just this whole uh, device or the, this way of performance, um, what it did to me. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I, I'm just that guy. So, long time ago, one of my friends decided to cook, um, to give me a muffin, and that muffin had something inside. <laughs> <laughs> so I eat this muffin. <laughs> then, uh, like five years before that, uh, I was on TV uh, and I was I played something on TV. So, so I'm sitting on the couch after eating this thing. I see myself on TV. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly, when I see myself on TV, then this thing start working now <laughs> on me. Then I go way, way back to my ancestors and my ancestors telling me <laughs> that, hey, we don't eat that thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then immediately after that, I go to my future and I tell my great, 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 great children that, hey, don't you ever eat that thing. <laughs> So this is, the, is that feeling, it gave me that feeling of the past, <laughs> the present, and the future, all at the same time. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, Tulani. <laughs> Thanks, Tulani. Um, gosh, from, from the perspective of the performers, I guess I'm really interested in knowing what it feels like to share the stage with a device, you mm -hmm. know, especially a device that allows you to see yourself kind of making. Um, I couldn't help but get the sense of like the fourth wall being physicalized, especially when you, when you guys were behind it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a very jarring experience for me. I'm, I'm trying to make sense of it. Um, there are so many possibilities, but also just the reality of there being a big old object on, in the space with you. What is that like? Another <laughs> question. I haven't actually played much in this. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, liar. I mean, this time around. This but, time around. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so, OK. <laughs> My experience in the past when I played inside the Papa's Ghost, um, okay, the, the, I think, yes, there is the fact that there is this very intricate and very, like, precise thing that needs to happen and it's there. But it also invites, I don't know if it's the fact that Ghost is in its name. Mm -hmm. There's that. Um, it could be also the space that we've worked in, this mm -hmm. particular space. It, it has an energy about it. But it also could just be the fact that it is a mirror. Mm. And the mirror itself is a thing that, it's a confronting thing, naturally. Um, and as a performer, that thing of seeing yourself, whether it's um, when you videoed yourself and it's being projected and now you must see that and interact with it, challenge. Um, or if it's just the idea, the notion of a ghostly mirror, or you being the ghost, or the ghost is, you know, the, the immediate place, and I, I think we saw this also in our most recent workshop, the immediate place is a very personal place. Mm. That's mm. where most of these pieces started, mm. was in a very personal place. Um, and somehow this, this device plunges you in, similar to what Tulani is saying, like, into yourself, in, and then out of yourself. Mm many times and duplicates you and then you're just you know which is where the collective making the collaborative making comes into play for people to yank you out of that and say consider this let's try this they jump in like Vusi said with or without permission um, you allow yourself to play you surrender you just 
Mm. Go, you know? Um, and play is a very vital part of it. I mean, deep, deep collaboration with other players, with everybody who works with the technical stuff for that precision, precision for that magic. Um, but also just to play because that's where you find the possibilities. And you can never forget that this thing actually exists. So very many moments, simple things like if somebody is playing a moment on the floor, in the third row, you're not going to see it. So you need to remember, hey, we've got something that can let you see. Mm. So it's that constant conversation with it, with yourself, and also remembering to pull yourself out of yourself. Mm. By yourself. <laughs> can I speak back to, to that, just as an observer from the outside, to that question? Mm. For me, observing the performers work with it really captures what, what is happening implicitly in performance all the time, that it's simultaneously an incredibly technical exercise, mm -hmm. whatever you're doing, if, whether it be re remembering lines, movements, hitting your light, mm -hmm. and then also really embodying and being within the moment. And this really pushes it to the extreme because you, you have a reference of a live camera that's recording what the audience is seeing being relayed through another projector that we as the audience <laughs> don't see that is being projected onto okay. the back of the screen. And so you are both performing but subtly clocking that reference and making sure that your movements are precisely in the right place mm -hmm. um, and at the same time conveying everything that it is that you're conveying. So for me it really stretches the performer and that implicit act of the balance and the dance between technicality and allowing the thing to move through you in a, in a profound way. Mm -hmm. So just to bring that complexity of what's happening in the, in the performer to the fore, I think it's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Athena. Mwenya, you had your hand up. You did this again. <laughs> <coughs> um, I was still trying to form the question, which is why I put my Sorry. hand down. No, no, it's OK. I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, uh, it makes a real difference to know, to hear that the footage is of a reenactment mm. and is not the thing itself. Because I, you know, it was interesting to sit here and watch it and feel quite uncomfortable with the footage. You know, in a, you know, I kind of sat here thinking uh, how this fits in the repatriation restitution. Mm debates at the moment mm. and what it means for us here on the continent to have access to this mm. material again mm. for the first time. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I get that it's part of what we're playing with. Um, and this is not a question. You see, this is why I put my hand down. Um, yeah, I guess this is just, you know, it was, it was quite uncomfortable actually to, um, yeah, to kind of be witness to the material here. So an interesting thing around that is that, you know, the, the, that yes, it on the one hand makes us more comfortable with reenactment because we, because we know these are reenactments, which is why it was dismissed as sort of scientifically interesting initially. Um, however, when working with some of the people who, the, the, the curators at the, um, and researchers at the Albert Kahn Museum who came here last August, and who initially watched the processes of, of artists responding, and then were gently pulled in by the artists to, out of the act of observer, and into the act of player. So where we had um, some of the curators standing behind images and reading out the, the um, captions in English and in French and Fon. So um, they then started to play more and more and realized that their bodies were also implicated performatively in the image. And it was at that time that some of the researchers started expressing their shift in relationship to the image, realizing that when one performs, one's intentions and emotions and connections to one's ancestors are as <coughs> vivid and real as when one might be in a ritual process, right? So discrediting performance or reenactment as something that is not um, authentic, 
I think is the first problem. And so, you know, I, for me, it's, it's, it, is, it is something that kind of lets us off the hook, and then it isn't. And, um, and yet, what is the alternative? Is it not ever seeing this archive? Because since 1930 until this year, it has not been publicly available or seen. Is that a better solution? Um, see, see, I don't have the answers to that, but I, I'm an artist, so as my curiosities are allowing us to play in that archive, um, and maybe be completely wrong. Um, but but I, at this point, the alternative to me, the muting, the silencing, um, and the lack of, of real engagement with we're taking that from the object, which it holds as an, in the collection or in a museum, into a conversation with the image, um, one that is probably mistranslated and with many slippages and very messy, but still real. OK. Well, yeah, are there any other questions, comments? Because we can, we can wrap up. I want to say a big thank you to Bongile Lechokhazulu, who's been my collaborator on this. Um, Bongile and I are curating the program of Pepper's Ghost Pieces. Um, it was a dream to be able to imagine you all in this, invite you, and have you respond with such open curiosity and, and hearts. Um, and the last few weeks have really been wonderful. Uh, and I can't wait for the next journey. I can't wait to see how it's responded to in the different contexts we're traveling it to. Um, and, um, and yeah, Bongi, you're the best thinking partner. Yay. <laughs>Thanks to Bronwyn, to Bongi, to all of the artists, to the production team, to the full centre team and to all of you for making your way to the centre tonight. Thank you very much and go home safely. <laughs>